Hello everybody. For this video I'll be featuring the ruby-throated hummingbird, and hopefully I'll be able to answer all the questions you may have about this beloved species, including how to make a safe, homemade feeding nectar. While there are many species of hummingbirds found in western North America, there is really only one that is commonly found east of the Great Plains. The ruby-throated hummingbird has the largest breeding range of all hummingbirds in the United States, and is probably the most abundant species. Ruby throats, as they are sometimes called, are so common, some people may not know or appreciate the treacherous journey that these tiny birds must make twice a year. Well, the vast majority of these birds do. While a small population winters in southern Florida, most spend about half a year in Central America and Southern Mexico. The other half of the year is spent in the United States and Canada, eh? Now, some of these birds circumnavigate the Gulf of Mexico during migration but it is believed that a majority of them are trans-gulf migrants. And those birds must fly about 500 to 600 miles each way without landing. Ruby throats may double their weight prior to these harrowing flights, and then lose half of that weight during the 18 to 20 hour journey. Aside from its incredible migration, the ruby-throated hummingbird is truly an amazing bird. Its insanely fast heartbeat, how many times its wings beat, etc. Males and females are sexually dimorphic, visibly different, with males being slightly smaller and having slightly smaller bills. Ruby-throated hummingbirds are basically emerald and white in color, with the males having the red throat for which they are known. Actually, the male's throat feathers aren't really red. The feathers, which resemble scales, are iridescent, so they appear red in the proper light. If you look at a male from the side, or in poor light, Sometimes the throat feathers appear matte black, as seen here. So, when viewing them, say, to distinguish one from a black-chinned hummingbird, look at the throat and you may eventually see a tinge of red or orange, whereas the black-chinned will show purple, even if it's just a small amount, as seen here. Male ruby-throated hummingbirds have pointed tail feathers and gray chest feathers. Females are about 3 inches in length and have whitest throats and white-tipped rounded tail feathers, the outer three feathers on each side of the tail. Adult males lack the white tips on the tail feathers, however, immature ruby throats, both male and female, resemble adult females and even have the white tipped tail feathers. But immatures often have heavier throat markings than adult females. Also, some immature males may have one or more iridescent spots on their necks by autumn. Hummingbirds have tiny feet they use for perching, but with which they cannot walk very well at all. While there are hundreds of hummingbird species from Alaska to Chile, only about 13 reside in the United States, and the ruby-throated hummingbird is the only one that breeds in the eastern United States. Their range pretty much runs from central Texas, north into Canada, and all of the eastern United States. Ruby throats will drink nectar from any flower, but they prefer red tubular flowers. They also eat some insects, including mosquitoes, fruit flies, gnats, and small bees and some small spiders as well. When regular food is scarce, they will also consume tree sap. Males typically show up to breeding areas about a week before females. After a quick courtship, males and females mate and then part ways. A female will spend about a week to 10 days constructing the nest. She will then lay one to three eggs and incubation takes about two weeks. The young are fully grown when they leave the nest at about 18 days after hatching. Nestlings are fed regurgitated insects, as nectar lacks the protein needed to grow. They will weigh much more than their mother by the time they fledge. Ruby throats raise one to three broods during a breeding season. Also, baby hummingbirds do not visit feeders. Often, people who think they saw a baby hummingbird at flowers or even feeders may instead have seen a hummingbird moth, or possibly a sphinx moth. Both visit flowers during the day and their wing beats are very fast, just like hummingbirds. Let's talk about migration, and I'll begin with spring migration. Ruby throats begin migrating to the Gulf Coast of the United States usually in late February or early March, and will continue to do so well into April, and maybe even May. Now, the earliest birds to arrive, usually males, may wind up breeding in the very northern portions of their range, but it can take weeks or even a couple of months for them to get there. Take a look at this graphic. You see here how these birds move slowly on their trip northward. They may be in Texas around the beginning of March, but it may be May before they reach Canada, eh? 
And I've had people ask me, after having a dozen or so birds at their feeders in early April, then completely disappear, where did they go? Did I do something wrong, they wonder? And no, they probably didn't do anything wrong. Most likely, those birds were destined to spend the breeding season farther north, and were just taking their time getting there. So if you have a lot of hummingbirds in April that disappear later, those were probably birds on their way north that just decided to spend some time at your feeders. And it's probably due to temperatures. In early March, I'm sure it's quite a bit warmer along the Gulf Coast than it is in, say, Minnesota or Pennsylvania. Do you know how cold it is in Minnesota in early March? No, sir, I don't. Well, it's probably pretty cold. So, in the southern half of the United States, it's possible that, say, in April, the individuals that will nest in your area during the summer haven't even migrated north yet from their wintering grounds. My late grandmother used to feed hummingbirds, lots of hummingbirds, and she certainly knew a lot about feeding them and their behavior at the feeders. However, like many folks, she didn't know much about them beyond that, about their lives away from the feeder and how they migrate and where they migrate to. Ruby-throated hummingbirds winter in southern Mexico and in Central America. As previously mentioned, prior to migrating south and along the way in the United States, these birds will bulk up on nectar, both natural and artificial. Now, I've already said they are amazing, but they are also cute as can be, and I love watching them, as many people do. However, some ruby-throated hummingbirds can be a bunch of jerks. And before you curse my name, by that, I mean they are not very nice to each other. They are not a social bunch, not at all. They see every other hummingbird as a competitor for food. If you feed them, you've no doubt seen them occasionally fight with each other. Even raising the young is a solitary affair. Once courtship and mating have occurred, the male flies off to do his own thing, while the female is left to care for the young, as mentioned previously. But the real mean ones are the bullies that set up at feeders. If you feed hummingbirds, you've no doubt dealt with a bully that chases away all other hummingbirds that visit for some nectar. I'm sometimes asked, when is the proper time to put out hummingbird feeders in the spring? And the truth is, I don't know. You can put up a feeder whenever you want, just remember that the sugar water must be changed before it becomes toxic. Generally, during the hot summer, nectar should be changed every couple of days or so, while it may last four or five days or even a week when it's cooler outside. Many people know about what time of year ruby-throated hummingbirds will show up at their residence. Again, this graphic will help you determine about when these birds may show up in your area. Now, I don't offer store-bought nectar because there's some scuttlebutt that store-bought nectar has stuff in it that's not good for birds. I'm not sure if that's true, so I just make my own just in case, and it's less expensive anyway. I make nectar by mixing table sugar and water. It's one part sugar to four parts water. I often use one cup of table sugar for four cups of filtered water, or water that has been boiled, then cooled. I then mix and refrigerate it. Also, a one to three parts mixture can be created when the birds are first arriving in spring, and then again before fall migration to help fatten them up. Now, it is also advisable to make sure nectar is about room temperature before placing outside. Never too cold or too hot. Also, I clean each container at every refill before any black mold forms. And if you clean a feeder at each changing, you do not need to use soap. Only use soap to help get rid of mold, but make sure to rinse extra thoroughly to remain any soap residue. And for general scrubbing, I use an old toothbrush and pipe cleaners. And some people believe nectar feeders shouldn't be placed where the sun will shine directly on them. Just out of caution, I keep mine in the shade as much as possible. Another question I'm often asked is, if I leave my feeders up in the fall, will it mess up the bird's migration schedule? And the answer is no. Hummingbirds will know when to leave, and it pretty much depends on the weather. Some years I've had all my birds disappear by mid-September, then other years, they've hung around well into October, almost November even. Some people ask, when should I take my feeders down? Well, you can remove them after your locals have left, but you may get some travelers from up north. Unless, of course, you live up north. So you can leave them up as long as you like, especially for those stragglers, other species of hummingbirds that may be passing through. But just remember to change the water before it becomes toxic. Have I missed anything about feeding nectar to ruby-throated hummingbirds? Let me know in the comments or send me an email at rnw at usa.com.
Obviously, hummingbirds can fly forward, but also backwards, side to side, up, down, on their sides, and upside down. And of course, hover in place. Also, they can stop on a dime in midair. Hummingbirds have the largest brain relative to body size of all birds. Also, they have the largest heart per body size of all animals. A hummingbird's tongue is like a straw with which they can draw out a lot of nectar, which is a good thing because they must consume two times their own body weight in nectar each day. While in flight, the ruby-throated hummingbird's wings beat about 53 times per second. Per second. A hummingbird's heart can beat more than 1,000 times in a single minute. When sleeping, their heart rates are much reduced to anywhere from 50 to 180 beats per minute. At rest, like when perched on a tree branch, a ruby throat will take three to four breaths per second. And last but certainly not least, if you step outside and see one of these birds hanging upside down from a feeder or tree branch, please do not assume that it is ill or dead. Hummingbirds often enter into a deep sleep phenomenon called torpor. It is a way that these birds conserve energy. There is no need to bother them. They will eventually wake up and be on their way. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you. Oh, hello. I'm Randy from Randy's Natural World. I hope you enjoyed the video on... Ruby-throated hummingbird. Yes. Yes, that's it. Today I'm pretending to be a scientist. Maybe I'm doing research on a five o'clock shadow, I'm not sure. But that's neither here nor there. I'm hoping to speak to those of you who haven't subscribed yet. Here's a list of reasons why you should. It's free. You can't beat that price. Number two, quality content. Always quality content. Number three, YouTube allows unlimited subscriptions, so there's no reason not to. Anyway, number four. Are you a procrastinator? There's no need to procrastinate. And I know what you're thinking. Randy, I'll subscribe when I get around to it. Well, here's your round to it right here. Round to it. So go ahead and subscribe. Go ahead. A wise decision.